Was that lull in Chinese cyber operations just a strategic pause? Huawei's on a charm offensive. People are seeing plenty of Russian trolling, but election hacking proper continues to be quiet. U.S. Cyber Command is said to be ready to respond to any election cyber attack swiftly and in kind. Later in the show, we've got my conversation with Shannon Morse from Hack5. And if you want to hear what people think about 80s technopop, a dark web market will sell you the relevant Facebook messages for just one thin dime apiece. Now a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Observe It. It's 2018. Traditional data loss prevention tools aren't cutting it anymore. They're too difficult to deploy, too time-consuming to maintain, and too heavy on the endpoint. They are high maintenance and require endless fine-tuning. It's time to take a more modern approach. With Observe It, you can detect insider threats, investigate incidents quickly, and prevent data loss. With its lightweight agent and out-of-the-box insider threat library, Observe It is quick to deploy and far more effective at stopping data from leaving your organization. That's because Observe It focuses on user behavior. It's built to detect and respond to insider threats, and it's extremely difficult even for the most technical users to bypass. Bring your data loss prevention strategy into the modern era with Observe It. Learn more at observeit.com slash cyberwire. That's observeit.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Observe It for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Friday, November 2nd, 2018. The lull in Chinese cyber attacks during the previous U.S. administration and the early days of the current one appears to have amounted to a phony peace, a zitzkrieg, if you will. Carbon Black's recent quarterly threat report has led some to conclude that the lull was a period of learning and development during which the PLA and the Ministry of State Security took lessons from Russian operations. Now it seems, as Ars Technica puts it, Beijing has taken the gloves off. Much of the Chinese cyber offense still seems directed at industrial espionage, as recent U.S. indictments of some of their operators would indicate, But increased tensions over trade and over Chinese attempts to encroach on international waters in the South China Sea raise the probability of other uses of cyber attack. The Five Eyes generally remain suspicious of Chinese hardware manufacturers, with a particularly hard scowl being directed from the Australian and American eyes. Huawei is continuing its charm offensive, seeking to reassure leaders in Canada and Australia that they've got nothing to fear, security-wise, from letting Huawei hardware into their 5G network build-outs. There may be a partial explanation for terse warnings of cyber attacks targeting Iran. Bleeping Computer says, based in part on reporting by Israeli outlet Hadashat, that Iranian infrastructure has recently been afflicted with a Stuxnet-like strain of malware. Evidence remains thin, so these reports must be regarded as preliminary, especially given the infections that have been named, which seem more like spyware incidents as opposed to ICS malware installations. Turning to the U.S. midterm elections, people are noticing the readiness of voters to swallow fake emails and catfishy profiles. What's surprising about this is the surprise as if everyone thought that the electorate was critical and sophisticated in the ways of persuasion, as if no one had ever heard of P.T. Barnum's observations on the birth rate of suckers. It's one per minute, in case you've forgotten. Trolling aside, and there's no shortage of that, observers are wondering where the Russians are in the U.S. midterm elections. The bears have been relatively quiet, which leads nervous commentators to breathlessly predict a big surprise for next Tuesday's voting. Among the scarier speculations are corruption or denial-of-service attacks on voter registration databases that would effectively turn people away from their polling places, or even a takedown of significant portions of a power grid that would also disrupt the election. U.S. Cyber Command seems to be ready to retaliate in kind against any Election Day cyber attacks. National Security Advisor Bolton said this week that any such retaliation would be short of war, But what those restraints might amount to in practice is difficult to say. Russian information operations may have been more effective at home than abroad. 
Apparently, conventional wisdom among Russians is that the U.S. will experience a second civil war by 2020. Celebrities and businesses sometimes come to take too much stock in their own press releases. The same might happen with trolling and statecraft, too. Foreign affairs are influenced by wishful thinking more than one might like to think, and authoritarian societies that strive to control information seem, paradoxically, more susceptible to this sort of fantasy blowing back at them. The BBC reports that tens of thousands of Facebook private messages, many from accounts based in Russia or Ukraine, are now for sale on the dark web. The proprietors of this particular market contacted the BBC to boast or to advertise their possession of data from some 120 million Facebook accounts. That number seems suspiciously high and has met with cautious skepticism, but the BBC did have security firm Digital Shadows examine part of the take and confirmed that 81,000 of the accounts did appear to be genuine. A crook with the hacker name F.B. Sailor, he probably meant to call himself F.B. Seller, but spelling is hard, described the offering as follows, quote, We sell personal information of Facebook users. Our database includes 120 million accounts, end quote. The wares went up in the online market back in September. The hackers, who've taken down their page since drawing attention to themselves, were offering the accounts for 10 cents a pop. As we've noted, most of the compromised data belong to users in Russia and Ukraine, but there have been a few victims in the U.S., the U.K., Brazil, and some other countries as well. Some of the private messages are intimate or embarrassing, but a lot of them seem pretty anodyne, hardly worth a couple of nickels the hoods are charging. Examples the BBC mentions include vacation photos, possibly embarrassing, chit-chat about a Depeche Mode concert, sure to be embarrassing, and complaints about a son-in-law, arguably better kept quiet, but hardly surprising. We're pretty sure Anatoly and Sergei already know what Tanya's and Sonia's moms think of them. Facebook says it hasn't been compromised and that they think rogue browser extensions were the source of the data loss. It's contacted the browser vendors and asked them to boot the bad extensions from their stores. The BBC's consultants think this is a criminal operation, not something run by the Russian intelligence services. That's certainly how it looks. One of the crook's websites, established in, where else, St. Petersburg, had an IP address that the Cybercrime Tracker Service says has been used to distribute the Lokibot credential-stealing Trojan. But a few words to the wise. Watch those browser extensions. Also watch your virtual tongue. Would you like your thoughts about that recalcitrant, probably dope-sodden layabout son-in-law to be on the front page of the Washington Post? Or worse yet, splashed all over Reddit? We speak purely hypothetically, of course, since Chad, Lamar, and Randy are no doubt swell guys. But it does make one think, doesn't it? It's time to tell you about our sponsor, Mantech. The cyber threat is growing, and so is the cyber talent gap. By 2019, ISACA predicts a 2 million global shortage of skilled professionals to meet demands. Mantec has the answer. They've been designing, building, and staffing Department of Defense cyber ranges for more than 10 years. With Mantec's Advanced Cyber Range Environment, or ACRE, organizations of any size can develop their own core of cyber professionals. Acre uses more than a dozen proprietary tools, techniques, and processes to emulate any network environment, regardless of size or complexity. Train, evaluate tools, conduct security architecture testing, and undergo live fire exercises on an exact replica of your own network environment. And do it with instructors who understand both offensive and defensive cyber. Mantech helps you think like your adversary and outmaneuver them. This is Advantage Mantech. See how Mantech can work to your advantage. Go to mantech.com slash cyber today. That's mantech.com slash cyber. And we thank Mantech for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Malek Ben Salem. She's the senior R and D manager for security at Accenture Labs. Malek, welcome back. Um, here in the U.S., we are coming up on our midterm elections. Uh, it'll be here before we know it. Uh, and there's been talk about using blockchain for election security. 
bring us up to date here. What do we need to know? There's been discussion about voter fraud in elections and the need to reduce that or the need to make sure that everybody who can vote is able to vote. We need to in- increase the number of people who can uh, actively vote. And one approach to do that is the use of online voting, right? But we know that online voting is not very secure. So there's been discussion about how can we leverage blockchain technologies to provide some of the benefits that online voting can bring while ensuring that there is enough security and uh, that the integrity of the elections is preserved. However, uh, I think it's important to know that, you know, some of the main benefits of blockchain technology, namely that it's distributed and, uh, you know, it's basically a distributed ledger, that those unique characteristics also, in some cases, are the roadblocks to adopting that technology for elections. So, for instance, if we talk about the uh, authentication of users or uh, the authentication of voters in a Bitcoin's blockchain, the typical way of using it is to generate a public address, right, where uh, that acts as a deposit-only account number. And then you have a secret digital key that you can use to send Bitcoins over. Uh, If you're dealing with a government election, that ability to have the voters create their own addresses should not be there, right? Because you want to make sure that the state and local authorities manage the lists of eligible voters. Uh, if you committed a felony in, you know, in certain states, you're, you're not allowed to vote for a certain period of time. So there is a need for some central authority to manage that list of eligible voters, uh, which basically does not make use of that main property of blockchain as a distributed ledger where everything is completely distributed, where every where every person can join the blockchain, create their own key, and and be able to you know transact. And and we know West Virginia, for instance, has experimented with this, but it, again, it's not the classical you know blockchain technology, but it's a modified blockchain based platform. The set of users that were used in this uh, test or case study uh, were using biometrics to authenticate uh, through their mobile phones in order to join that blockchain-based platform. But uh, I think blockchain brings certain properties and components that may be very useful for conducting online elections, but certainly the technology is still not that mature and it will not be the way we know Bitcoin blockchain, but it will be certainly a modified version of it uh, where uh, a lot of the authentication and the identities are handled off the chain. Yeah, and it's interesting too because of the way elections are handled here in the U.S. where they're headed up by the states. So it seems to me like that provides an opportunity for miniature labs, you know, to, for, for the states to experiment with things on, on a smaller level uh, and, and see if they work. And if they do, other states can, can follow their lead. Exactly. Before we move on to uh, a nationwide election. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, as always, Malek Ben Salem, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dave. And now a word from our sponsor, Edgewise. If you've been following cybersecurity news in the past year, you've probably heard the phrase Zero Trust Security more than once. The TLDR of Zero Trust is to never trust and always verify every connection in your environment. That all may sound well and good, but the next questions are how, why, and where to begin. If you're in search of a guide to help you get from zero to zero trust, Edgewise Networks has you covered. They recently published Zero Trust Security for Dummies to help organizations like yours understand what Zero Trust Security is and how it can prevent breaches in your cloud or data center. Zero Trust Security for Dummies has the answers to all your Zero Trust questions. And the book is available for free. You can download it at edgewise.net slash cyberwire. That's edgewise.net slash cyberwire. And we thank Edgewise for sponsoring our show.
My guest today is Shannon Morse. She's a host and producer at Hack5.org, famous for their popular YouTube channel, podcasts, pen testing gear, and immersive infosec training. They've built an impressive community of professionals, students, and hobbyists with a contagious enthusiasm for hacking, security, and all things tech. I started off really getting interested in uh, computers because I used to build my own computers as a kid, Hmm. and I was also obsessed with theater as well. So when I got into college, podcasting did not exist. Cybersecurity was still a very budding industry. It wasn't even a very large industry when I was in college. So I went into a completely different major. But after college, I made friends with the Hack 5 crew, and I didn't have any career path plans at the time. And Hack 5 was just getting started. uh, And they asked me to join them in Virginia. So I did. And at some point or another, they said, do you want to try to host a segment? So I did. It was a terrible segment. (laughs) It was reviewing an open source uh, video game. But they liked it. They thought that it was really cool, even though I was super awkward on camera. But over time, I've really developed a passion for it. So I'm completely self-taught in cybersecurity, uh, information security and hacking and making. And I just fell in love with it. It took my love of theater and my love of building computers and allowed me to share it with more than just myself and more than just a, you know, a small job. I was able to share it with a multitude of people that subscribe to our channel now. Take us through what are the things that you cover over on Hack 5? Uh, So Hack5 specifically covers uh, information security for professionals and for budding hackers, uh, people that are interested in cybersecurity but aren't really sure where to start. Uh, We focus on a slew of different playlists that kind of introduce the information to uh, young budding professionals. So for example, I've done videos about Linux terminal hacking. Uh, So I've done a lot of command line interface information. I've done Wireshark tutorials and Nmap and all sorts of different software tutorials. Mm. Uh, We also focus a lot on hardware hacks too. We've built our own products that a lot of professionals use in cybersecurity now uh, that are even listed in NIST, uh, which is pretty awesome and we're pretty proud of. Uh, But we've been doing podcasts and selling products online for about 13 years now. Uh, The store started up in 2008. However, the podcast has been around since 2005. Uh, So it's, it's a cool job. I would not be lying if I said that it's my dream job. So I'm totally happy and really uh, uh, grateful to everybody that watches it because I'm able to live a dream job right now. Yeah, well, good good for you. Uh, you and I uh, met recently for the first time out uh, in Las Vegas uh, at Black Hat this year. You were one of the keynote presenters at the Diana Initiative. And uh, can you just uh, tell us what drew you to that? Why did you think it was important to present there? The main reason that I wanted to do that is because the longer that I've been a part of this community, not just in the convention aspects or the YouTube aspects, but the the community for information security as a whole, uh, I've noticed that there's a lot of women in the industry, but a lot of them don't really necessarily have a voice. There's a few of us out there. You know, there's me, there's Kate, there's Hacks for Pancakes. There's quite a few of us, um, you know, who, who share a lot of our opinions and things on Twitter and we do a lot of talks, but there's a a lot of young women who are students, who are young professionals, who haven't necessarily ever given a talk. They don't have a big voice online, like on Twitter, on YouTube, and uh, they're just trying to start their young professional lives. So having Diane Initiative uh, was really nice because it's it's informing people that there, there needs to be more diversity in cybersecurity. Uh, currently, women make up like 11 or 13 percent. I forget the exact percentage, but Mm -hmm. from 2017, it was like 11 or 13 percent of the industry total, uh, which is terrible. So I was trying to go there um, and introduce more people to cybersecurity, especially for, um, you know, the the minorities out there, Uh, not just women, but, you know, people of color and uh, people that are not necessarily white males. Uh, Mm. No offense, Dave. (laughs) It's okay. None taken. (laughs) Uh, So, and I would love to see that too, because when, whenever I work and I've worked in several different office spaces up till now, I've worked at a bank, I've worked at a lot of restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've noticed that we grow a lot as an industry, 
no matter what that industry is, when you have a whole bunch of different people in there giving out of the box ideas and they're able to share their experiences because if you if you just close yourself off to a very specific type of person, uh, then you you limit your ability to grow as a business. So not only is it really good to you know have women there just for myself selfishly, but also for a business because you can be highly profitable when you make your business more diverse. Yeah, and I I, uh, I was lucky enough to be there when you were giving your presentation and enjoyed it very much. Um, one of the things that you pointed out was that uh, sometimes by being in the public eye, by being front and center, that uh, made you the target of some unwelcome attention. Oh, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> One thing I learned early on when I was doing video shows on YouTube is that uh, people definitely share their opinions in the mm. comments and people will share their opinions over email or Twitter, wherever they can find you. And those opinions will not necessarily be constructive. Sometimes they will be destructive criticism and not necessarily good positive feedback. You can definitely give constructive feedback, but you can give it in a positive way so that it influences the person that you're giving feedback to to do better in their future. Uh, however, a lot of times I've experienced a lot of destructive feedback that is not necessarily focused on the content that I'm creating, but is focused on me as a person. Uh, for example, I've had people tell me they don't like how I speak or they don't like that my nails weren't done one day and I was showing <laughs> some I was showing a product off on a camera on a close up mm -hmm. camera. Uh, there's a lot of strange things that people uh, decide that they want to share with you. Um, and I've also experienced a lot of harassment, too. Uh, definitely based on the fact that I'm a woman, I'm a female in the industry, uh, but also that I'm outspoken, too. I'm definitely very outspoken on Twitter and, you know, I believe that we all have the right to be outspoken, but uh, I definitely try to follow that kind of morale of being somebody who brings positive feedback to the industry and is not somebody who comes in there and attacks all the time. I don't think attacking people is uh, something that really helps us grow uh, worldwide, you know, as a community. Mm -hmm. I think that it, it definitely helps to be somebody who is a positive influence and who other people want to look up to and, you know, want to uh, be a part of that kind of group. So, yeah, I, I definitely deal with quite a bit of that kind of stuff online, but I have learned how to tune it out after 10 years. It definitely helps to have a lot of friends that are in an industry that I can talk to. So I've, I've opened up quite a lot and discussed these things with my friends and family and husband, et cetera. Uh, but it also helps to, you know, just uh, have that kind of, I don't know what you would call it, um, uh, that kind of feedback from your friends and family, that support group, I guess it would be. Mm -hmm. um, having a support group definitely helps with dealing with that kind of uh, harsh criticism or harassment online. Um, and also learning how to block and learning how to filter certain words definitely helps too. Mm, right, right. So you, <laughs> you have to have a thick skin, but, uh, but in addition, uh, your technical skills pay off as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's Shannon Morse from Hack5. You should check out all the things they do over at hack5.org. There's more to our conversation that we didn't have time to include in today's program. We're going to post the complete interview over on our Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash the cyberwire. You don't need to be one of our supporters to access it. So do check it out. It's patreon.com slash the cyberwire. And that's the Cyberwire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the Cyberwire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can help protect you using artificial intelligence, visit Silence.com. And Silence is not just a sponsor, we actually use their products to help protect our systems here at the Cyberwire. And thanks to our supporting sponsor, VMware, creators of Workspace One Intelligence. Learn more at VMware.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our CyberWire editor is John Petrick, social media editor Jennifer Ivan, technical editor Chris Russell, executive editor Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. <laughs>